Uh, we will begin the Wednesday, May 13th, joint meeting rules and open government community committee of the whole. I see we're joined by Vice Mayor Jones, Council Member Davis, Council Member Camus, Council Member Ray Nessing. Um, let's see here. I know we have a, two additional council members here. Um, yes, so we do have a quorum, everyone's present. Um, we begin <clears throat> with a review of the final agenda, May 19. And <clears throat> I believe there's an ad sheet that has several items. That's the maker of the motion to consider two items one for Mental Health Awareness Month, and one relating to the agreement with St. Clair County for cost of food distribution. Uh, we'll begin with a review on pages five and six. This is Tony. My computer's frozen, so I can't share the agenda. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Good luck with that. <clears throat> All right. Pages seven and eight. Are there any changes there? Pages nine and 10. Uh, pages 11 and 12, are there any changes? Pages uh, 13 and 14. Page, pages 15 and 16. Um, Dave, what do you think? Should we be starting this one early? I would concur to that, yes. So make your motion might consider an 11 a.m. start. Motion to approve um, along with the ad sheet. Okay. That includes the mental health awareness sponsored uh, district event and the agreement with Santa Clara County for distribution of food necessities. And second, I'm assuming that includes the 11 o'clock start time. And includes, yes, 11 o'clock start time. Awesome. Great, thank you. Uh, Blair Bakeman. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, hi. Uh, as this will be, uh, you'll be nicely talking about digital inclusion uh, uh, issues uh, on this on this agenda. Uh, I thank you for that. And um, you know, to, to some of the most important things, we're entering our second stage of this uh, pandemic now. Um, you know, I really have to ask, and how what can be, you know, real good accountability practices of ourselves and that's what you're doing next week and i thank you for that and it's just you know you have a nice way to clear the air sometimes and i i, I just i hope we make commitments to do that a lot and uh i'm really for measure t public oversight to be a broadened uh, approach this summer and ways that the community can have a real organized way to discuss issues with, with yourselves as government and to really be working on that stuff. You know, the importance of what, uh, you know, the technology accountability ordinance, you know, was designed, you know, for better relationships and better communication. And, um, you know, to really, to really respect that at this time, I think can accomplish a lot for ourselves. And, um, so good luck in your efforts and your work. And I guess that's about it for myself. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Speakman. Um, there's a caller who uh, is using the, the caption call-in user. Yes. 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 Yes.
off the device that's allowing you to hear as you're calling in. That way you won't get the feedback. Call in user one, you want to try that again? Okay. Call in user one, your hand has gone down. Um, so unless I see your hand go back up, I'm going to assume that you didn't wish to speak on this item. All right, the, the hand has not gone back up. So we'll come back to this item. Uh, all in favor on Council Member Rance's motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Okay, that passes unanimously. Uh, we have no council meeting on the 26th of May. Um, we have a on D1, a, a request for a setting of a council meeting on August 4th. Yeah. Mayor, uh, this is Rick. I, uh, I have a short memo attached to the uh, item. Um, this item came up uh, as, as a result of the lawsuit involving the registrar of voters. Um, we received the uh, court decision uh, Friday night, and um, it um, it was so it was after the rules committee last Wednesday. That's why we were asking the committee to consider it now as an urgency item. And so the committee needs to have a, a vote first, uh, and uh, needs four votes to determine whether it wants to hear the item or not. Okay, so first we'll consider whether or not we want to hear this item. Um, is there a motion or a comment? So moved. Second. Second. Okay, uh, motion and second. I'm going to see if any attendees want to speak. They don't. All right, on that motion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, so we can now consider that item. That's unanimous. Um, and with regard to the addition of August 4th, can I just add one consideration? I, certainly I'll support this, but it seems to me since nobody's going on vacation, presumably, <laughs> and we're all gonna be conducting meetings by Zoom anyway, um, and I'm not wishing this on anyone, but should staff need council to get together to vote on something over the summer, it shouldn't be hard for us to be able to set that date. And I just wanna sort of encourage uh, Dave to think to, to consider that flexibly because uh, we're not going anywhere and we can all be within Zoom reach. You appreciate that, Mayor. And, and what you will see at Rules next week actually is the normal item that comes forward that sets the council agenda for the next period, um, mm -hmm. but understood that this need had some urgency around it and appreciate what you're saying about July. Um, you know, I think, yeah, so we can kind of think through that. Okay, great. Yeah. Right. And there I can add that a special meeting can be set on 24 hours notice. So if it if it's something that needs to be done quickly, uh, there's an ability to do that, assuming council members can be found. Um, the, uh, this is to set a regular meeting, though. This would be your first regular meeting in August. Right. Okay. And and, uh, and you typically, as the city manager indicated, it comes with the, the whole six months. But there's a, the reason to bring it forward now is we're uh, in the process of uh, having a meet and confer session with the county to determine uh, the scheduling and costs, ultimately costs of, of the count. Um, and the later we can push out the, the date for the final count, the court order currently says June 23rd, but if we can push that out, uh, it would save overtime costs and as a result uh, would reduce the, the cost of the uh, count uh, to the city. Um, so we uh, recommend uh, uh, approval and here to answer any questions. Thank you. Any comments? I move approval. Second. Motion from Councilmember Davis, second from Vice Mayor. Okay, uh, Tony, would you like to have a roll call vote? Sure, Arenas? Yes. Davis? Yes. Camus? Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. And Camus, you were muted, but I think you said yes. Yes. Sorry. Okay. All good. We got everybody. Great. Thank you. Uh, we're on to the public record. Um, checking, I believe Mr. Beekman would like to speak. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. 
Thank you. Uh, a short speech. Uh, I wrote three public letters that uh, speak uh, to this to these issues. Uh, speak about today. Um, as we are entering a uh, second stage of this pandemic, uh, I hope we are considering uh, that government can be considering uh, how to be open and how to describe short-term and long-term economic packages of the next year, and to learn how to create a public safe space where we can all talk about thoughts and ideas openly and simply, simply without competition. How do we maintain economic traditions without forcing ourselves into undue burden, debt, and actual pain? Respecting traditions is one thing, but I hope we can be open to at least short-term creative ideas that can be of help and relief to all of us. Thank you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to practice my words from yesterday that, you know, we've got a long way to go with this, uh, with the economic ramifications of the pandemic. And I hope you yourselves can explain, a, explain the possibilities and what's possible to the public uh, for the short term and the long term. And I think you'll get good answers. I don't think you'll get massive pushback. You'll just get debate and you'll get, you know, honest questions. And I feel we're at a time we have to really, um, be open to you know really different ways of thinking for at least the short term to really get over the financial hump of things at this time. And I, I just hope we can all be open to that as a community and work towards those things as a community. And you know, I really want to address how technology, we gotta be careful of it and wary of it. And that the responsible practices that I'm a part of, you know, it's a way to work towards that. And it needs to be taken seriously and work, you know, as a community on it. And I hope we can do all of that. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. All right, back to the committee. <clears throat> Is there a motion? Motion to note and file. Second. Second. Is there any objection to that notion? Motion, rather? Hearing no objection, uh, that motion passes on E, public record. So we're on to item F1, which is an appointment to the VIVA Advisory Committee. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Uh, are there any objections to that motion? Hearing no objections, that passes also. We're going on to G1, which is the consent calendar relating to Affordable Housing Month. Move approval. Second. Second. Are there any, uh, Mr. Beekman? Hi, uh, is this is this item have to do with uh, with overall housing questions at this time? Uh, the approval of the Affordable Housing Month. It's a it's an event sponsored by Councilmember Perales. Oh well, that that's very nice of him. And I I wanted to politely remind of the many bills that are going through California State Assembly and um, the Senate at this time that are trying to deal with the, you know, the long-term issues of how there can be debt relief and mortgage relief. And there's some interesting beginnings. And, you know, I, you know, I'm a flaky, you know, young guy. And so I, I really believe there can be a system that we can be, you know, full debt relief can be established and how to work, that has to be the goal. And, you know, we're slowly inching towards that and the steps we take are important. And um, as long as we're progressing towards that, that's what counts at this time and, and to have that mindset. And um, so they're doing some work at the California state level that I invite everyone to look into. It's, it's good, good stuff. And how do we better develop that? Because people really, are not responsible for what has happened with this pandemic. And it hurts that they have to foot the bill and it, it, it's painful. And I wish there could be ways to solve this. They shouldn't have to be paying for any of this debt, sort of debt. And uh, it's these short term uh, things that I hope could be of you know, help to work out of this time and, and to make a clean slate and start of how to you know, start again, basically. And so I thank you for your time and uh, good luck in all of our efforts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Is there any objection to the passage of the motion relating to item G1A? I'm hearing no objection. Uh, that passes then. We're on to item two, which is the zoning code amendments, title 20. Is Council Member Jimenez on the line? 
Okay. Uh, well, the, uh, the no, member member not, uh, this is Luke Mears, uh, uh, who uh, I, I work for for the council member and am happy okay. to uh, answer questions. Is this Lucas Ramirez? Yes. Great. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Welcome. Um, uh, you, is there anything you wanted to say before we launch into questions? Uh, sure. Uh, so, uh, as uh, I think, uh, so first, thank you, Mayor and, and uh, members of the Rural Committee. I think you will recall that uh, this memo uh, was intended to uh, speak to some of the items in what is uh, what is now 10.1a on the land use consent calendar for the um, council meeting next Tuesday. And just uh, very briefly uh, going through the recommendations. Um, recommendation two is intended to um, uh, address or, or seek clarification on which zoning districts, the new uses that state law um, requires cities to allow in certain districts. Um, uh, to, to, cl to clarify which zoning districts these uh, uses must be allowed in. Uh, and uh, my understanding, I, I know planning staff is, is uh, available to speak to this. My understanding is uh, that a supplemental memorandum will be made available that will address some of the, the questions that the council member had um, and uh, Rosalind, uh, you, you uh, probably uh, will know better than I um, what, uh, what, what, whether additional zoning code amendments are necessary in order to, uh, to implement AB 2162 and AB 101 specifically. Um, and I'm happy to, to speak to, to the questions that the council member had, if that would be helpful. Uh, uh, item three or recommendation 3A uh, would simply add transitional housing as uh, as a use in the use tables. Right now, it exists as a defined use, um, uh, and the the referenced ordinance uh, includes transitional housing as well as permanent supportive housing. But um, currently, neither of those uses are found in the use tables, uh, and the council member had recognized that uh, AB 2162 would um, uh, would require, or I guess the staff is. Uh, intending to implement that law by explicitly listing um, permanent supportive housing as a permitted use in the appropriate uh, zoning districts, um, but we have not done uh, we have not done this with transitional housing. Uh, so the, the recommendation simply would be to list trans transitional housing as uh, or in the use tables in the uh, zoning districts that uh, the municipal code currently allows transitional housing in. Uh, 3B, my understanding is this is the the, uh, the item that would require uh, more work from staff, but it, it, it comes out of uh, an experience that we learned uh, from uh, Life Moves, which was, uh, I believe, trying to add some additional beds to an existing shelter. Uh, we learned that there were some challenges associated with doing so. I, I believe Life Moves has submitted a letter to this effect, um, but this would uh, direct staff to return with some modifications to the zoning code to streamline the, the addition of beds in existing shelters and specifically non or legal non-conforming shelters in industrial zoning districts, uh, as uh, you'll see in the council members memo um, with zoning code modifications made last year, um, several shelters that uh, were uh, legally constructed in industrial zoning districts have become non-conforming um, as emergency shelter no longer is allowed in those zoning districts. And um, for recommendation four, um, you know, consistent with the council and the city's goals to increase the availability of emergency shelter, transitional housing, and permanent supportive housing, um, the council member is uh, simply seeking to um, uh, see if there are additional um, modifications that could be made to identify any obstacles. And again, my understanding is that uh, staff will speak to uh, some of these efforts in their supplemental uh, memorandum. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we see the uh, response from, uh, I believe it's either Rosalind or somebody on Dave's, oh, from Michael Brio, excuse me, that uh, items 2A, B, and C are green lighted. Um, and some uh, remaining items are yellow lighted. Is that fair, Rosalind? Yeah, and if, if I could, before Rosalind jumps in, Mayor, I just wanted to 
because we have a lot of items on the agenda today. So I think, you know, just stepping back a little bit in terms of how we're approaching these things, you know, we're in addition to the green, yellow, red process, you know, we're looking to see if it's if it's COVID related. You know, if it's if it's COVID related and in response to the current emergency, uh, you know, we're inclined to move forward with those items. And, and if it's not, then I think we're we're putting it through the same level of um, review that we normally do with the green, yellow, red. Um, we don't see this as COVID related. Um, and so this this has been put through our normal process of evaluating evaluating workload and 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 so Rosalind can now speak to if she wants the uh, kind of the green red yellow approach and, and why you see the uh, the recommendations that we're making. Yes, thank you, Dave. So uh, staff has had the opportunity to review Council Member Jimenez's um, memorandum, and as Lucas stated, um, items two A, B, and C. Uh, we have recommended as a, a green light. Um, and actually we are drafting a supplemental memo that should be issued by Friday for the item for, for Tuesday's council meeting. Um, item 3A is also um, a green light. 3B is the item that will uh, require additional staff analysis in terms of looking at expanding emergency shelters in industrial areas. Um, a couple of key things would be um, impacts on existing industrial uh, users in these areas, um, as well as we think that we would want to do some outreach, obviously, to um, industrial users and, and really to the community at large. So that's the reason for uh, recommending a yellow light for that item. And then item four, we have recommended a green light. Um, actually, we um, have recently established a housing team in our citywide planning section um, that their main responsibility is to facilitate housing, including permanent supportive housing, transitional housing, uh, and shelters. And we'll be coordinating uh, with the housing catalyst in the Office of Economic Development um, on any future um, considerations or policy changes uh, to facilitate those uses. Okay, great. Any uh, comments or motion? Mayor, I have a question. Please. Um, if these are all green light, except 3B, does it go to council for consideration on the, on the um, ordinance item? Or are staff saying they're already, they're, they're already working on these items? So staff is not currently working on item 3B. It's not currently in our work plan. Um, and we do have obviously several other council priority items that we're working on. Um, so that's why we have recommended it as a yellow light. So that, but that means it goes to priority setting. Right. We, that's correct. We can do that as a motion here to send 3B directly to priority setting. The other items, they, do they need to go to council? Well, I think what Rosalind is saying that, and, and what I'm hearing is that we're the other items, they're greenlit and we're able to pretty much integrate them through a supplemental memo with the item that's already scheduled for council, I think is what I'm hearing. Okay. Yeah. So that doesn't need a motion. It does. It does. The, 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 the item still has to go to council for, for direction. I mean, the, the, the memo seeks to re council direction to staff and staff is saying they can do it. Um, but it still requires council to say, we want you to go do it. Okay. So the motion would be to direct, to, to send item three B to priority setting and to send all the other items to council. The next week. Yes. The next. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, any comments, uh, Councilor Kamis? Oh, no, I had a, a similar question. I'm, I'm not necessarily, yeah, I think the uh, item 3B was a little more troubling to me than everything else, but but I, I'm glad we're going this direction. Thank you. All right, on the motion, uh, Tony, could you roll call vote? Arenas? Yes. Davis? Yes. Thomas? Yes. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Okay, we're on to... 
Uh, item three is the fee cap on food delivery services. I see Councilmember Jeff is with us. Yes, Mayor. So uh, this is coming back from last week. So I, I have no new comments, just here to answer any questions. Essentially, I think um, I've heard stories from small businesses, restaurants in particular, uh, how they're, they're having a harder time because a lot of these delivery fees uh, are, are taking a huge kind of portion of, of their profit. And, and right now everyone is using the food delivery um, companies. So I'm, I'm just fearful and mindful of the impact on small businesses. Of course, I'm also mindful of the impact on the food delivery services as well. Uh, we want to make sure that they're able to uh, provide the service of delivering food. But I think it's uh, something that the council should uh, debate and uh, see where we land on that. All right, let's go to the public and then we'll come right back. Um, go ahead, Rick. Did you want to jump in? No, I, I was just going to say we're, we, uh, we're just, I was going to report back on uh, the legal side of this, but if you want to take comment first, that's fine. Let me take a comment. We'll come right back to you. Uh, Mariah Ray. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Thank you. My name is Maria Ray. I'm the public policy and partnerships lead at DoorDash, which also includes the Caviar brand. I hope my comments today can shed light on who we are, how we operate, and the services we make available to San Jose residents. The core of our platform is logistics. We connect customers, restaurants, and couriers through our website and mobile app. And our platform enables restaurants to reach customers online and offer delivery, which is something most of our restaurant partners had never been able to do before. And we've taken a lot of steps in light of COVID to provide relief to restaurants. Namely, we've eliminated commissions, which is the fee that we collect from businesses on all pickup orders at the end of May. We've eliminated commissions for restaurants that are new to DoorDash or Caviar for 30 days. We've instituted a $0 delivery fee for customers on Saturdays to help restaurants attract new customers and keep delivery affordable. And largely, we've reduced commissions by 50% for local mom and pop restaurants, those with five or fewer locations through the end of May, which has been the savings of, for roughly 750 restaurants in San Jose. We've done a lot for couriers as well. Those are the delivery workers, the independent contractors who deliver on our platform. We've provided PPE free of charge. They have access to two weeks of earnings um, if they're affected by COVID-19. And Dashers in San Jose are earning at or around $27 per active hour, including tips when they're on our platform. We're also very, very proud of our partnership with the city, the health trust and local restaurants to power delivery of 14,000 meals to seniors and homeless residents in San Jose alone. And I'll just close with this for our platform to work. It has to work for restaurants. And so we're open to constructive dialogue. I'd welcome questions about our fee structure. We have grave concerns, however, about this proposal because we feel like it would have massive unintended consequences to consumers, couriers, and even the very restaurants that the proposals are aiming to help. Again, happy to take any questions diving into our business model, our fee structure, and anything else anyone would like to know about. Thank you. All right. Uh, Neil LeBlanc. Thank you, Mayor. Hello. Council members, um, just back again this week, uh, reiterating our support of uh, Council Member Dieppe's memo. From last week, um, we're looking at any and all opportunities to offer relief to our hard hit downtown hospitality businesses at this time. Um, won't say any more at this moment, just wanted to support the memo and uh, thank you all for your efforts. Thanks, Dave. All right, uh, back to committee, uh, Rick and then Dave. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I'll address the legal issues, and I think the city manager staff may have some issues uh, uh, on the policy questions. Um, the, uh, the we did look at uh, Seattle and San Francisco. Uh, both have issued emergency orders, so uh, the city manager, as the city's emergency services officer, has the ability to issue an order that would accomplish this if if uh, he so wished. Um, or the council can adopt an urgency ordinance and the alternative to, um, to, to enact this as well. There's some concerns just, I think, operationally. Um, the, um, yeah, this, this calls for a 10% if, if PPP or protective wear is provided, 15% where it's not uh, in terms of the cap. I think we're really not staffed to keep track of that. I think that would be a, logistically a very difficult if the council wanted to go there or, or the manager. And so both, uh, both San Francisco and uh, Seattle have the same cap. I think it's 15%, but they don't 
have a requirement on the on the PPNA. And I just think logistically it's difficult. But that would be something for the council if this moves forward for the council to consider if if, if they need be. Um, the um, the rationale obviously is that the, the fees are eating into the profits of the uh, uh, the restaurants, particularly small restaurants, and you need to have some kind of uh, backup for that. But um, uh, the rationale, but um, in terms of evidence, but the the it, it's doable. It's been done again. Uh, there's two ways to go, and uh, with that, I'll, I'll I think Dave or uh, Angel, somebody has yeah. Has Thanks, Rick. And, and Angel is there to kind of help with this. So just kind of going through our review, uh, certainly COVID related. So it's not a, we're not you know, kicking it to anywhere else. I think it, it merits the discussion. Um, I, we certainly had not identified this as an issue for uh, an emergency order coming out of the EOC. Um, so I hadn't seen the, uh, the, the, I guess the need to, to issue that type of order. Um, weren't seeing the issues associated with this. So, um, you know, it's up to, I think, council to decide. I, I think Angel, I think there we can kind of add more context about what potential unintended consequences could be from this. And I, I think that's probably the, the biggest concern. Um, so Angel, anything more you want to add there? Yeah, D Dave and, and, uh, and Mary, council members, um, you know, from a, from a food distribution perspective, uh, we, we definitely have engaged both restaurants and delivery operators. And, and quite frankly, more, more recently have been working, have been relying on delivery operators, especially as it relates to reaching, uh, you know, hard to serve uh, seniors that are isolated. The, the one uh, red flag or concern that comes up for me is, is would this have the unintended consequence of hindering our ability to reach uh, vulnerable individuals in outer parts of San Jose. Uh, I do know that with the San, San Francisco ordinance, they are having difficulty getting food distributed to the Treasure Island area, for example. We're hearing uh, you know, uh, some, uh, some feedback around that. And so th that would be a concern. Um, you know, uh, given that we have worked with both restaurants and delivery operators, you know, I, I think from a staff perspective, you know, perhaps a, a, a more intentional uh, discussion between the two of them is, is more appropriate prior to jump into an ordinance. But uh, uh, obviously we haven't analyzed this from every perspective from the full impact around restaurants nor delivery operators, but just coming from that perspective around food distribution, uh, I, I sure would hate to have anything really interrupt that because then the default would be that then the city would have to pick that up and then that creates another kind of fiscal burden on the city. Um, so anyway, just uh, some additional food for thought and context uh, as uh, just to add to your discussion. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Diep, did you want to respond at all? Yeah, sure. So to Rick's point, I, I, I completely understand that. And I'll even flag another potential legal issue is uh, for whether uh, companies can can be asked to provide uh, PPE for independent contractors because one of the kind of if you use if you're still using that prong about whether you're an employee or independent contractor, one of the things is independent contractors provide their their own tools. Uh, but I, in recognition of that, I, I drafted it the way I drafted it anyway, simply because I think we should be encouraging companies to provide for PPE. And I didn't expect. I would, I would assume that no company would say, no, we don't want to provide that. So everyone would just fall under the 15% anyway. Uh, so in my thinking, I, I just wanted to encourage uh, companies to provide it. And uh, I think that the speaker was from DoorDash. I've, I've actually spoken with her previously. And I, I, I know that DoorDash provides it, and, and, but other companies might not. I think recently, just this last week, we, we heard uh, there was a story in San Jose Inside about another competitor that, that does not provide them. So I, I do think the issue bears council consideration. Um, as for this concern about not being able to provide service to the outside the suburb areas of San Jose, I am sensitive to that and I'm open to doing what we can to ensure that it doesn't cut into the, uh, the business model. But I will say this, I, I think that it is, um, we, we live in a time where a lot of consumer uh, expectations are being, are being skewed. I, I think that um, any of us today, if we were to buy something online because we're afraid of going to the store or places and we don't want to stand in line, we would expect two day delivery or one day delivery. And sometimes we, we would expect it for free. And the truth is 
there are costs involved in that, whether it's US Postal Service or UPS or FedEx or whoever, there are costs involved in that. But the more that companies like Amazon and others are able to subsidize the cost of that, we feel that that is a free service and that's not the actual reality. And in food delivery, if, if DoorDash, like the speaker said, is paying $27 an hour to a driver to make a delivery, well, and we as a consumer are able to get that for however much it costs to, you know, 10 bucks or, or eight bucks, somewhere along the way, that cost is being subsidized. And it is my contention that a lot of that is coming off the backs of the profits of the small independent restaurants or the restaurant chains. And I, I think that's, that's not quite right in my thinking. I think, I think that if we want food delivered to our homes, we should be willing to pay the cost to get the delivery there because it's, it's you know, we can go out and get it ourselves or we, you know, get dressed, comb our hair and go do it, or we have somebody drive it and risk their lives or their health potentially to bring it to us. Uh, and so that cost should be transparent and we should understand that we are using, a, a, a in my mind, a luxury service to have food delivered to our home. In, in the case of Angel, when he's talking about food delivery to seniors and vulnerable populations, I completely agree with that. And I would think that even if the cost on the consumer were, were raised somewhat, um, the, the governor during this time has that program for seniors where they can potentially get what 60 something dollars a day. And I think that, you know, comes out in the wash, I think. But again, I'm not insisting that what I proposed verbatim uh, makes it through council. I, I do think that we should have something, whether that's a 15% or something else or some other exceptions for suburbs and further areas out in San Jose. I, I'm open to that discussion, but I do think the, the issue should be addressed somehow. I'll yield. Appreciate I appreciate the thinking, and certainly I'm very receptive to the proposal. Um, but I also want to be sensitive to some of the concerns that were raised, um, particularly angels. And we have seen where this is having an effect. Um, angels write about Treasure Island. There are other parts of that city that simply don't get deliveries as a result. Um, and I, I think I'm guessing if we spent enough time sitting around the table with folks, we'd probably want to come up with at least a two-tier zone or something like that, that essentially lift the limit. Um, if someone's making a delivery down to Coyote or Silver Creek and it's going to be an hour trip, um, you know, there and back, or you know, it's obviously there's there's much more involved in the delivery um, than if it's a few blocks away. So I, I would like to suggest a, a way of moving forward because I know staff that is involved in this is also the staff that is busiest right now delivering 2.6 million meals a week <laughs> to to families in our in our region um, that if we could take this up again in a week or two and give us time to meet with industry representatives and i'd be happy to lend my own team uh, my staff to work with yours Councilmember Diap and anybody else who wants to join in um, to see if we can maybe come back with something that is a little more nuanced that ensures that we don't cut off food delivery completely to some parts of our city. Um, if you'd be receptive to that, certainly something I'd be more than willing to, to take up and then we can bring something back. Yeah, sure. I, I'm, if that's what the, the rules committee likes, then, then that's what I'll, I'll live with. <laughs> I've had pushed back the week, but yeah, I'm, we, we can definitely do more um, discussions and, and whatnot, but I, I do hope to get this through sooner than, than later. Yeah, understood. Uh, so what do my colleagues think? <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I had the wrong panel up. Uh, Council member, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Jones. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I will make the motion to uh, defer this, but since we have Ms. Ray um, here with us now, um, I wanted to ask her a few questions, um, if we can make her available. Okay, Mariah. I'm Mar here, thank you. Oh, all right. Mariah, um, talk a little more about the business model. I know that it's public information that services like yours um, currently are not profitable or haven't achieved profitability. And can you, um, for what you can provide us, can you walk us through the, the, the business model in terms of the cost structure and the fee structure, and then also address uh, the question that came up um, about transferring some of those costs to the consumer? Mm -hmm. So can you walk us through that, please? 
Yes, thank you for the question, Vice Mayor Jones. Commissions help pay for a wide range of services that we provide restaurants. And our business model is to partner with restaurants who enter into a, an agreement with us. It's a business to business contract where we provide a set of services for a fee that they pay us. And that fee can be paid as a percentage of the subtotal or based on how the restaurant chooses to use our service, it could be paid as a flat fee. Um, I'll expand on the second example really quickly. There are some restaurants who have their own channels. They have their own app, they have their own website. They drive customers to their website through their own marketing and they contract with us to do what is arguably the most labor intensive part, which is actually fulfilling the delivery order. Those restaurants pay us a flat fee. And I raise that example because it makes it inherently difficult to impose a percentage price cap when we're charging a flat fee, right? But in the instance where we are charging a commission fee, which is a percentage of the subtotal, that fee goes towards paying a variety of things. It pays for our insurance costs, our credit card processing fees for each order. That can be three to 4% of the order subtotal alone. So just carve that out from the percentage that we collect. That's just going straight out the door. It goes towards advertising and marketing costs. It goes towards the thousands of customer support agents that we employ to respond to requests from customers, delivery drivers, and the restaurants themselves. It goes to the cost of building and maintaining a website and our app. It goes towards the $100 million of commission relief that I outlined earlier, including the 50% commission cut. So our revenues are really coming from the restaurants who pay us commissions and from consumers who pay us a service fee. So what we've found is that in this time, consumers are incredibly price sensitive, but they wanna support their local restaurants. So restaurants have told us that the most important thing we can do is to subsidize delivery for customers because that's what's getting their orders to come in through the door. That's what's getting them to be able to keep their lights on, frankly. So we really have concerns with a notion that raising consumer fees is actually the way out for platforms like DoorDash to be able to manage a, a price fix because frankly, customers will stop ordering. You know, we've modeled this extensively. We know that raising consumer fees leads to customers ordering less frequently, but also ordering in lower amounts. And those are both things that the restaurants who are hurting the most don't wanna see. And going back to the, um, the issue that was raised about San Francisco and uh, a reduction in the service area, um, what, what was the thought process behind um, the, it, the enactment of their ordinance and the reduction of the service area? Was it strictly cost-based or was there other considerations? What, what went into that thought process? Yeah, so I'll say that, you know, we are one platform in a pretty crowded field of a few providers. And it's true that one of the platforms opted quite publicly to reduce their service area as a result of the price cap. Because, you know, I can only imagine they made a calculated decision that it was no longer affordable to be able to continue making deliveries to that remote part of the city. Um, I will say that, you know, that exists probably even more prominently in a city like San Jose, which has, you know, pretty far flung districts, um, you know, areas where there aren't restaurants, um, areas that are harder to reach. And I'll say that in response to COVID-19, I mentioned that our biggest driver for merchant um, relief initially was driving volume. What we did initially at a cost to ourselves is actually expand service areas at the start of COVID-19, because that's something that's within our control. We can take the addressable market for a restaurant and we can expand it ourselves within our app, within our algorithm, and allow for restaurants to reach more customers and drive more sales to them. And frankly, to allow more customers to access the restaurants that they wanna order from, given that restaurants were actually closing their doors. So we did that early on. And I'm you know, afraid to think through what we would consider doing if a permanent, if a, if a temporary and potentially permanent cap were you know, considered, we would have to think through some of those decisions to expand those service areas to the more far-flung districts. Um, and, and, you know, frankly, we would have to rethink some of the other things we've done at our own cost to be able to provide relief to restaurants at this time in San Jose. So I'm going to ask you a, a very obvious question. If you're losing money on 
every transaction or most transactions, is that a sustainable business model if your ability to um, increase your fees are, are, are capped? I think it probably goes without saying that everyone's hurting a lot in light of COVID. And so at this time, we continue to be a, you know, a, a, a business that is not making profit. And we actually are continuing to, to you know, uh, force, force self-injury, um, as I stated with the, the commission cuts that we've imposed on our own selves. I think that you're, it's fair to ask a question, is this sustainable? I think that a lot of us are coming to terms with what we can do in a sustainable fashion, how long we can do it. The fee cuts that I mentioned, the you know zero dollar delivery, those things are intended to be temporary measures because we simply can't afford to survive if we were to continue to do these things. So while we have imposed these measures voluntarily, it's in order to uphold the strength of our entire ecosystem. We are nowhere without restaurants thriving and surviving. We are nowhere without dashers wanting to have earning opportunities on our platform, continuing to log on, seeing wages that they want to be able to earn and accepting deliveries. So we need to maintain the health of our ecosystem for people to, people to be able to be fed. Um, so I don't, I don't see a future in which these measures can continue. These measures are very painful. They're costing us $100 million across all of our markets combined. But I do feel like you know we, are, we would like to enter into constructive conversation and talk about what it means to take these measures on and talk about what detrimental impact it would have for these measures to be taken on in a more permanent fashion because it would be severely detrimental to our business. Thank you, uh, Mariah. There's an old uh, business adage that if you're losing money on every transaction, you can't make it up on volume. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, my major concern about this whole proposal is that we're putting uh, businesses and companies in a position where one, they're having investors subsidize another business partner or business entity, as well as we're putting, we're creating and tinkering with their business model where they're not able to even break even, let alone make, make a profit. So I'm gonna make a motion to uh, defer this for, how many uh, weeks did you wanna uh, see, Mayor? Can we, can we take it two weeks? Two weeks. I'll make a motion to defer this for two weeks. Is this to defer to council for two, like to go to council and to rules. rules? Yeah. Back to rules. Back to rules. I second. second that. Okay, there's a second from Councilman Rennes. Uh, Councilman Camus? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I have similar concerns. I think most of the restaurants that I have talk to are actually benefiting because this is uh, the only avenue pretty much available to them during COVID. And without uh, these business partners, a lot of these business businesses would die. I mean, they would just go out of business. So to me, it seems that uh, this could be, I mean, I don't mind discussing it, but this could be uh, punishing the very the very hand that feeds you or like biting the very hand that feeds you. I think that, that uh, businesses right now, I, can, I don't know if um, the uh, Mariah is still on the line here, but nobody's forced to get into DoorDash. Nobody is forced to use DoorDash to, to it's, it's a voluntary application. If you have your own business, you don't have to use this, right? This is Maria. Yes, that's right. Sorry, restaurants Mari, have a I choice apologize. to join our no no problem restaurants have a choice to join our platform they can also leave our platform at will okay so if they didn't like the costs or if they think that they were being gouged they can go to another carrier or hire their own delivery person correct that's right yeah no i i we know i, I want to hear evidence of why it's needed uh, you know you know i want to hear from a business if, if Lund has it. I, 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 you know, the only reason I want to bring it back is to, to hear from any businesses that are saying, hey, I need this uh, thing to happen because I'm not hearing that we need these uh, regulations. And I, I don't know if this question is for staff. How would we enforce such regulations? Are, are we going to get into the going into people's businesses and is it complaint driven or what are your thoughts on how something like this could be enforced? 
Well, I think it would be a complaint driven system if, if the if the world knows the fees are capped. I mean, the restaurants really would be the ones that uh, would uh, have to track that and complain if to the extent that it, the fees are excessive. Um, you know, I and again, I think this is if if, if the motion passes, the mayor is going to get information that in San Francisco, the the these were not ordinances passed by the Board of Supervisors. Uh, this was an order issued by uh, in Mayor Lennon Breed uh, in, in, in San Francisco's case. And it really was, there was a lot of lobbying by the restaurant industry to, to accomplish this. So um, I think the, it's, it's good to get the factual basis and the factual evidence to, to determine need and, and, and where you want to go. Yeah, no, I would like to hear from anybody in the restaurant industry, quite frankly. I, I want to hear evidence that a regulation is needed before we go into regulating. And so, so th that, you know, I'm hoping that that is what comes back uh, in two weeks time, uh, not just a regulation, but I wanna, I wanna hear that there's a need for regulation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Rennes. Uh, thank you. So I um, also like to, uh, when you when this comes back, I'd like to uh, hear a little bit more of a breakdown. And is it M Marie, Maria, Mariah? No, I got it wrong. <laughs> Say your name again. It's Maria. Maria. Why well, can't? Good no Lord. problem, Maria. <laughs> Uh, so, Maria, I'd like to hear a little bit more. I, uh, I appreciate the breakdown that you gave uh, uh, Vice Mayor. I'd just like to know a little bit more of the breakdown on that gig worker because it was all uh, part of uh, the credit card fee and the overall administrative fee. Um, and my concern is what is this going to drive um, uh, DoorDash and others like you to do to wages in order to create your own profit if there's a cap um, and if there's an unintended consequence on gig workers. Personally, I, not, I don't use any food delivery because I, especially during COVID, because I think if I'm not willing to uh, take that risk to go get that food, then um, I shouldn't be cooking. <laughs> I shouldn't ask somebody else to take that risk for me. So I, you know, we go and get the food ourselves um, uh, straight from the restaurant. And so I admire that you um, are all doing this and at a risk, uh, financial risk to yourselves um, to keep food going uh, to the places that are difficult to get to. So I appreciate that effort. Um, could you just share a little bit more in terms of what the breakdown is for, for those uh, dashers that you call them? Thank you, council member, for your question. Um, and I'll, I'll just share anecdotally that, you know, I looked right before this meeting and, and noted that Mexico Lindo, Diloc Vegetarian Cuisine, Rajot Indian Cuisine, these are all restaurants in your, in your district that have all benefited from our 50% commission relief program. So if you were to ask, you know, council member Camus is asking for restaurants to raise their hand and say, we need this. If you were to ask restaurants in your district, particularly the ones that are on DoorDash, that have five or fewer locations, which is our definition of you know a mom and pop. Those are restaurants that have already received a 50% reduction and are probably very happy with third-party delivery because it not only allows them to reach customers who, you know, unlike you, may not have the ability to leave their home because they feel, you know, they maybe they're elderly or immunocompromised or unsafe to do so. Um, you know, or they just they just prefer the convenience of delivery. So uh, I appreciate your question. You know, while I'm not in a position to share the percentage, you know, breakdown of this much, this percentage goes towards dashers. What I can say with confidence is that is, it is by far the largest portion of the fees we collect. It is really important to us that dashers are able to maintain a flexible and significant source of earnings through the DoorDash platform. It's what keeps them, you know, happy on the platform. It allows us to retain really top quality dashers. And it's just part of our value proposition to the entire community is that it provides this outlet for restaurants to reach customers, but it provides this flexible source of earnings for people who may have lost their job or you know, would like a supplemental source of income. Of course, it has to make sense for everyone. What, what would you say uh, would um, be maybe an unintended consequence if we had a cap? Um, 
for the, the dashers without breaking down any percentages. I'm, I'm guessing they would have a, a lesser portion of, of uh, a profit. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have to think about it as like money in, money out. And the money that's coming in is largely going to them. If there's less money in, there could potentially be less money going to them. I can say just with a lot of confidence that dashers are very, very concerned about this. In cities that have considered this, where we've asked dashers to write to lawmakers, there have been cities that have, you know, considered a cap at the mayoral level. There have been cities that have considered a cap at the county or at the council level. And where we've asked dashers to weigh in, they have weighed in in droves and provided a ton of anecdotal evidence for why they rely on the source of income, literally begging their council members not to take the source of earnings away from them. In New York alone, we had 3,000 dashers write in to their council members and to the mayor when we asked them to. And that was within a few hours of asking them to because they were just so struck that the council would consider taking an action that would hamper our ability to collect fees that largely go to them, right? To keep them afloat. So I share that just as a way of saying, you know, I know that that sentiment exists across the board. That's not unique to New York or, you know, Chicago or other places where we've asked dashers to speak up in this way. Um, and I do feel like San Jose dashers, you know, some of them come from San Jose. Most of them are from within the city limits. These are your residents. You know, these are your, these are your constituents. These are folks who, like I said, may, may have been laid off or furloughed or are just looking for an extra source of money because they're not getting the hours they need. Right. And, and that's who we're really concerned with upholding in addition to the mom and pop restaurants. Sure. Th thank you for that. Um, so I, I would uh, um, like for us to come back and, and if we could, uh, Mayor, include that in maybe in your discussions as you're talking to, to the different companies. Um, and also uh, when we take this back to council that we don't ask staff to, to um, produce a whole um, ordinance before we get a chance to really talk about it. I think it was it would be premature, but I think um, once you have a conversation, Mayor, with um, the heads of the, the industry here, I'd probably be a lot more ready in terms of an ordinance than I think at this point, um, because at this point, I think it's still uh, at a level of discussion. Um, and I know that staff is working quite a bit on a lot of things that we're asking them to do, and so asking them to uh, spend some time in the ordinance before we have a discussion is, um, doesn't make really good use of their time, I think. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember, yeah. Yes, thank you, Mayor. So, I, I, before the council or before the rules committee votes, let me just want to address two things that I heard during the discussion. Um, Vice Mayor Jones was saying we shouldn't have an ordinance or some sort of rule that uh, would force investors to kind of subsidize business models and such. But, but I would just want to point out that this is the reality whether whether san jose or other cities regulate at all the business model as it is is requiring investors to invest in it to subsidize it doordash in particular i think has been around since 2013 other companies have been around since you know 2014 whatever the whole business model is burning through venture capital in to what ends to what end, to eventually make a profit but to make a profit by reshaping the market i believe uh, and and so I am a free marketer as much as anybody. I'll, I'll hold up my bona fides for, 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 against Councilmember Camus and, and anybody who who's a Republican capitalist or conservative or whatever. I, I'm right there with you. But I, I will point out that there is no market that exists that is not regulated to some extent. And the question that I'm putting before the council is, should we regulate and to what extent? Because I feel like the, the comment earlier that was made that we need to preserve this current ecosystem to ensure that people are fed, I think I, I don't quite agree with that because people are being fed. This the ecosystem here is it's a question of convenience. Yes, there are instances where there are people who are disabled and who can't get out, and I'm very sensitive to that. But there are also people who just couldn't be bothered to put on pants and go get food. And 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 to, to, for those people, like if you want food brought to your home, then you know, pay the fee to get the food brought to your home, twenty-seven dollars an hour. That's on you. It is not by any means that like if this, these, these food delivery services don't get, don't continue that people are going to be starving in the streets. It, as a matter of fact, if, if we were to just go directly into the restaurants and just stand in line, stay six feet apart, 
the, the restaurants would get the full fee of the burger or the pizza or whatever we're buying. And I'm sure that they would be much happier if we are buying directly from them rather than going through third party apps and sharing their profit. Because at the end of the day, in my view, just one person's view, the, the genius of the app is that when you have people around the country, around the city with an app on your phone ready to go, then it's just convenient. And then if you're a restaurant, you're not on the app, you're not seen, you're not going to be able to sell your food and, and whatever, because you're not on the app. So you want to get on the app. And once everyone is on the app, there is this market that has leverage over the restaurants. It's like we have reality TV shows now that still exist because the 2007 writer's strike in Hollywood made it that shows just happen to have to you know, be unscripted. And now we're stuck with like The Bachelor or whatever uh, because there was a time when people couldn't be written. And so this is what I'm talking about. And just You're trying to reel this back in, Catherine. Yeah. All right, I'll reel this back. Let me just share the screen real quick uh, if I can do this. And just so you can get a sense of why I was curious about getting into this this area. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. So this is this is something that was going off the internet. And just so you can see, this is not DoorDash, this is Grubhub. But they did 46 orders, a thousand dollars in profit, but at the end of the day, the restaurant got $376 out of it. So this is what we're dealing with. Maybe not in San Jose, but this is this is something that's out there. So this is why I wanted to get involved in, in regulating this. Can you tell us where this is from? I, I picked this, huh? Where is this from? What's this I, I picked from? this off of people talking off the social off Twitter. So so I I can't I'm not saying this is out of San Jose, but I'm just saying this is an, an instance of one company, you know, taking fees and commissions that ends up, I think, taking a, a, a huge chunk from what would otherwise go to the restaurant itself. Okay. All right. So understand you're not pretending that it's scientific data no. or no, I'm not saying this is San Jose, or this is happening in our area. I'm just saying this is off somebody put up their their statement out of frustration and i'm just sharing it okay so that's all i'd like to unshare this okay <laughs> all right. right you're back <laughs> thanks council member um uh, okay so uh mario thank you for your uh your insights and we'll certainly uh engage with you and other colleagues of yours in the industry and try to see uh, where there's room, if any, to, to be able to move forward with something like this. Um, at least that's the direction of the motion if that's approved. Any final comments? Um, I see someone has just raised their hand in the public. Jason Allred? Yes, this is Jason Allred. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks for giving me the time. Just quick, um, I'm the owner of Henry's World Famous High Life in downtown San Jose. So, yeah, wow. um, yeah. So uh, talking about uh, this issue, if you guys want to talk to someone in the industry restaurant, I'm available. Uh, Nate has my information. If you want to get a hold of me, I'd love to talk to you about it. But um, I think we're talking about pre-COVID-19 and the current situation. So pre-COVID-19, you know, these fees that uh, delivery services want to charge, that's an option for a restaurant. You can or or don't have to do it, right? But right now, this is kind of our only option, right? Or one of very few options. And so uh, looking at the fees and maybe regulating them is something that we should really look at in, in the situation for now and only for temporary. Like when this is over, right? We can go back to where it was before if we need to. But as a restaurant, we kind of have a choice right now. So I just want to put that out there. And um, also deferring it, it makes sense because you want to have the right information. But I think the longer we wait to defer this, if we're going to do something, uh, keep in mind, the restaurants have been doing uh, this for a few weeks already. And a lot of them are hurting and a lot of them are close to shutting down. So any kind of relief that they can get, whether it's even a few dollars on fees, situations like that, it's going to help. So uh, just that's all I want to say. And uh, thanks for the time. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Thanks for the great ribs and chicken. Um, I believe uh, Mr. Beekman is also on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, this was an interesting uh, topic for me to learn about today. And, uh, you know, you, you're, you're trying to get uh, into the process of talking about, uh, you know, economic models. And uh, I'm you know, I come from the philosophy at a time like this, uh, how can we keep prices down? And, 
as as low as possible to to ride through this time period. And uh, the last the last uh, public speaker was was interesting. Uh, the restaurant owner, um, you know, I maybe uh, with the guidelines that uh, you can create as a city at this time, maybe that can set a standard and a pace that uh, you know that both restaurants and DoorDash can follow and give them a regulatory model. And, you know, I, that, that can go a long way. And um, so I guess that's about all I have to say on this item. Uh, I'm trying to learn how to relax <laughs> and just simply uh, speak, uh, you know, speak more my casual mind. And so I guess it about covers things for now. So thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, back to the committee on the motion from Vice Mayor Jones. Oh, I'm sorry, a uh, hand's raised, forgive me. Councilmember Rain? No, Councilmember yes. David. Thank you. Um, I will not be supporting the motion. I, I agree with the, um, the owner of Henry's High Life that taking action sooner rather than later would be better. I don't think we need to wait to come back to rules in two weeks. I would rather it went to council in two weeks. Um, and if that was the motion on the floor, I would support it. I think our businesses are hurting. Our restaurants are hurting. We're going to talk about another initiative, Mayor, that you and I proposed for just that purpose. Um, this is another thing that we can do. So I will not be supporting the motion. Okay. Councilman Reyes, forgive me. Did I cut you off? We try No. Okay. Um, okay. Any other comment? All right, then on uh, Council Member, or Vice Mayor Jones's motion to for a couple of weeks. Uh, Arena? Thank you. Arenas? Yes. Davis? No. Camus? Yes. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Okay, we'll take on this hot potato in a couple of weeks. <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody. Back to, uh, let's see here, item four is the uh, San Jose Alfresco proposal. Uh, and I'll go first to members of the public on this item, and then we'll come back to the committee. Uh, Nate LeBlanc. Hello again, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to hear public comment on this very important issue. Um, Mayor, we, as the San Jose Downtown Association, uh, gratefully took place in the press conference last week and are actively supporting your memo to allow for use of the public right-of-way to give businesses space to conduct um, their operations safely during this pandemic. Um, what, what we need to begin discussing today, and I know that you're here to do, is the how and the when and the where and the why. And um, at least in the downtown area, what we really want to push for you guys to consider is uh, having as much of as possible by right. Um, and if it, in particular to uh, consider the totality of the issue for um, the restaurant industry in particular, um, it, taking sidewalk space, as long as there's room for pedestrians to go seems to be easily enough to consider, but closing streets and having them monitored and uh, kind of extending premises, particularly for alcohol, are extremely thorny issues that need to be considered. And we're going to need strong leadership in order to do so. So uh, we support your memo. We support the idea behind this. And what we really need to see is a quick consideration of how this can be implemented safely and how we're actually going to do this. And in the downtown area in particular, again, just. Uh, want to avoid lengthy permit processes, expensive permit processes, and um, people needing to buy new equipment such as fencing or um, velvet ropes or what have you to maintain their premises. We need to do this with what's available on hand as quickly as humanly possible. And we thank you for your leadership in putting this forward. Thank you. Sorry, I'm unable to see a participant list right now because the screen seems to be jammed up. Uh, Jason Allard. Hello again, uh, Jason, uh, owner of Henry's World Famous High Life. Thanks everyone for the time. It's great to see you all. Uh, I just wanna give you a little perspective from a uh, food service business on this. Um, based on some of the guidelines we've seen come out of California and other states for reopening the economy, 
uh, and how the issue of outside service is going to be critical, a critical option for restaurants and bars in the near future. Uh, not all restaurants have large spaces or square footage, like us. And so social distancing inside is not going to be a viable option. It's an almost certainty that uh, restaurants and bars will not be back to normal capacity anytime soon. And normal capacity is what we need, what restaurants and bars need to stay in business. And if our, out, if our indoor capacity is limited, which it most certainly will be, we will need to be able to serve outside. Um, the process of getting permission to do this via permits can take months sometimes, weeks or months sometimes, and we need it to be by right. And we need it to be by right so it's immediate. Um, if a restaurant or bar owns or leases the property or for serving food and drink, they should be able to serve outside as soon as the city uh, gives the order that restaurants can open for dine-in. It needs to be immediate. Uh, and this includes alcohol sales. And this is important because uh, alcohol sales are so important to the, to the success of restaurants and bars. The city will need to address this with the ABC, no doubt, uh, so that no one's at risk of losing their license for serving outside of normal parameters like the sidewalk or parking lots. And uh, we can't be expected to rent or erect fences or barriers um, because we don't have the money to pay for it. Alcohol sales are incredibly important to us. And so serving outside must include alcohol. The margins on food are not enough to keep us going on a limited capacity basis, keeping in mind that most restaurants have been operating on food margins only and uh, significantly reduced revenues for, for months now. So outside seating options and outside alcohol sales will be critical for restaurants and their ability to survive in the next few months. And uh, if we want to get our bars and restaurants back up to full capacity quickly, outside seating will almost certainly do this in many cases. Uh, thanks. That's all I have. Uh, hey, Sean. Uh, thank you, Mayor Ricardo and Councilmember Davis for your leadership in putting forth the San Jose Alfresco memo uh, forward. Uh, my name is Eddie Trung, Director of Government Relations at the Silicon Valley Organization. We are the region's Chamber of Commerce, representing the interests of over 1,200 businesses in the region. Uh, again, I want to iterate our strong support of this memo. Uh, first of all, thank you to the mayor and to Councilmember Davis for your proactive uh, and visionary position in terms of uh, preparing the city of San Jose's local restaurant and businesses to operate safely once shelter in place um, orders have been relaxed. Uh, we know this, which is that when shelter in place is relaxed, um, that our restaurants will still be operating at likely 50% or less capacity for dine-in options. And so the city of San Jose has a really great opportunity to be proactive in this way. Uh, we missed an opportunity not too long ago, just a few weeks ago, when the city could have been doing inspections and allowing construction sites to proceed once the uh, public health guidelines have been met. Um, let's not miss this opportunity now and for the city to meet your, um, your proactive position now and to do the work um, to allow restaurants to operate by right and to be able to uh, continue as soon as the county public health um, department has issued the green light for our restaurants to be able to safely reopen. Thank you for your consideration of my comments. Thank you. Um, there's a caller who's uh, got an area code of 916. Welcome. Hi, Mayor Licardo. It's Katie Hansen with the California Restaurant Association. Um, it's a pleasure to address you and the fellow rules committee members. The Alfresco dining proposal is in alignment with the California Restaurant Association's recommendations for reopening neighborhood restaurants. Creating additional creative outdoor dining spaces will be necessary to ensure proper physical distancing procedures during this pandemic through the greater use of outdoor public space. The proposal addresses and seeks to eliminate the financial burdens of application costs and waive permitting fees to allow for outdoor dining. Um, this is a critical aspect of helping San Jose restaurants reopen in this tough time. We respectfully request a vote in support of the dining proposal today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michelle uh, Huttenhoff. Okay. Michelle, could you remove uh, yourself from mute? We're not able to hear you yet. Okay, Michelle, you've put your hand down. Unless I see your hand go up, I'm gonna assume that you did not want to speak on this item. 
Uh, perhaps it was on a different item. Uh, so, oh, your hand is back up now, Michelle. Could you unmute yourself? Go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, uh, sorry about that. Um, my name is Michelle Huttenhoff. I'm the policy director for Placemaking in Public Life with SPUR. We are absolutely thrilled with this program. We think it's going to be really transformational in the city, not only during this time as we move back online through this pandemic, but really as a way to manifest a lot of the work that the city's been doing around public life over the past several years. Um, we really urge uh, that this type of initiative is casted citywide. Many of our small businesses are located in very uh, distinct neighborhoods in the community that could benefit from this type of intervention. But we also recommend that this be packaged with a few other measures. And in our outreach in the community, we've heard two things. One, that businesses need flexibility and they need additional space. And so we've submitted a letter that outlines additional measures we think could be beneficial from creating business recovery zones, reducing fees and allowing for implicit temporary uses, analyzing capping delivering fees, which you've all discussed prior, and then rethinking parks and parking lots to serve as multi-use spaces. And so we look forward to the conversation and are here to partner and support this work um, throughout the next several months. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle, and thanks for your and Spurs partnership on this. I will come back to the committee and um, just want to first acknowledge that this is not by any means a new idea. It's something that people like Blagaze, the Lalich, and, and, and Kim Wallish, and many others in the city have been working on for several years about how we can better utilize uh, our public space and bring people outdoor. Uh, it just so happens this is an emergency when it becomes more of an imperative for our uh, businesses to be able to bring commerce outdoors. And I think there's a bit of an opportunity perhaps in this crisis as well for us to, to think a little differently. I, I appreciate the input from several members of our community about the desire to have by right access. And obviously that won't be possible if we're talking about closing streets, but perhaps uh, with some, uh, some of the more modest uh, opportunities, for example, to use uh, private uh, parking spaces in parking lots, for example, in a strip mall, wherever, you know, those are the kinds of things that hopefully uh, we might be able to get to uh, simply some, some by right uh, access to really relieve burden within City Hall and relieve the burden on businesses to have to, to, uh, to deal with applications and delays and, and obviously fees. So recognize that there's a desire, I think, all around to find an easy way forward for folks, although there are undoubtedly going to be conflicts in, as there always are in the use of public space as long as we have 19 year olds speeding along on scooters, uh, we're gonna have safety concerns about how people use the space and may have to manage it very carefully. So um, why don't I go first to, let me ask Dave or Kim, did you wanna jump in before we go to the committee? Um, no, I think we're good. You know, I think this is obviously COVID related. So, um, and so we're supportive of, of, of bringing this forward and doing the work associated with it. I know Kim and Blog have already spend some time on it and have some thoughts about it. So um, look forward to sharing those with you. Okay, great. And uh, we, of course, are fortunate to benefit from partnerships like uh, SPUR and Downtown Association. I think there's gonna be a lot of ideas about helping us identify the ideal geographies to be able to start and, and make this relatively easy on folks. Uh, Councilmember Davis, thank you for your work on this memo. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanted to clear up one thing before I go into my comments because I've gotten some emails about this and it is that we are just trying to have uh, staff and, and all of us in the city be ready for when Dr. Cody allows businesses to be open again. Um, there were some comments that I got over email, I don't know if you did as well, Mayor, um, very concerned that we were reopening uh, businesses too early with this memo, and this is not what we were intending. So I just want to be clear. I know all my colleagues understand that, but I want to make sure that the public understands that we we at the city know that we are not the people who decide when businesses can reopen, but we are in charge of land use, and we want to make sure that we are ready and the staff is ready with policies to be put in place so that businesses can reopen and be profitable again. Um, so I just wanted to make that 
completely clear because uh, there, there was some confusion about that, I think, when people read in the paper about it. Um, but I, I am so grateful already to the enthusiastic response from, from city staff. I heard from a few city staff uh, even last week and earlier this week that they were already talking about this and trying to figure out how it might work. And I know that there were, there, I spoke with some business owners already on Lincoln Avenue in my district and they're also already kicking around ideas and have ideas on how this might work in their area. So I'm hoping that we can have engagement very, very early so that we can kind of build in the flexibility and not have to take things case by case um, or area by area, but that we can have staff directly working with our business owners as they're crafting the recommendations for us so that we can have it kind of all, all ready to go when, when the businesses are ready to be open. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Kamis. Well, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I, I have to say hallelujah again. There's two weeks in a row, Mayor, uh, for memos that you're involved with. Uh, <laughs> I have, I have um, been talking about this for quite some time, ever since I've been in office. And think, in fact, I've been asking Angel Rios to allow for our even our parks to be used. Uh, for vendors and uh, we even had a pilot a while back, but I'm glad that we're going down this direction. Anything that we could do to help these businesses stay afloat um, and allow people to use, to enjoy some of the outdoors. I also don't want this to be limited to downtown. I think there's a lot of areas in my district that could be a benefit from this ordinance. Um, you know, maybe take away two parking spots out of a big, you know, um, uh, parking lot area and I, I'd love to see it expanded past downtown I, I, and my own, that's my only my only comment is I don't want to see that uh, you know just for downtown yeah, Council, I'll make a, yeah sorry it was certainly not our intention we we do expect this to be citywide and you know as Joel a member of our team commented to me it may be the easiest place to, to do this would be in a strip mall uh, and and you know places like yes. downtown have a lot of conflicts in public space, but obviously it's a place that's critical for us to be able to get people outdoors. Uh, so, so we do want it to be citywide and, and I think uh, we're going to find opportunities both in downtown and throughout the city. Yeah, no, I think strip malls are perfect. I mean, it, it, you know, right next to your dry cleaners, your sushi place, <laughs> you can sit down and um, in any case, um, well, and um, I really like the fact that uh, Councilmember Davis, uh, Dev, uh, you, you, I did get a lot of phone calls. When can I do this? You know, and so um, I'm, let, you know, I told them to st slow down. The county has to approve it. <laughs> so uh, I don't know. Have you made a motion yet? I didn't move. I move approval. Second. Okay, motion and second. Other comments. Um, Kim Blagay, I realized I, I don't think I allowed you guys to jump in. It was. So anything you wanted to add or any words of warning? Uh. <laughs> no, just we're totally on board with this opportunity. And just a really bright spot is we already had a great conversation with the state director of ABC, and it was okay. very positive. I mean, he's great. generally inclined to continue to allow these relaxed regulations um, concerning alcohol sales with restaurants, even if we bring it outside. So um, we're, we're really excited about this. That's happy news. I thought ABC would be particularly challenging given our past experience. So that's great news. Councilman Rest. I have a question. I, I'm really excited about this too. So congratulations, Mayor and uh, Councilmember Davis. This is absolutely in line with our, our wonderful California weather. So I'm excited because we don't get a lot of these um, outdoor uh, businesses uh, or outdoor seating uh, for our strip mall type of businesses. And so I'm really excited about this. How is this going to work with our storefront grant? I, um, I guess, first of all, is our storefront grant uh, still going to be up and running? And how is that going to work with that? I suspect we'll decide in June, huh? <laughs> uh, if they wanna... well, I hope it doesn't go away. And, and that yeah. way it can work in conjunction. I know in our uh, village square, we were able to get a couple of storefront grants 
for some of our new businesses. And so I know this is for like the permits, the cafe permits and fees, but I think it would be a great idea if we could marry those two things. Um, and then that way they can also, uh, we can help absorb some of those fees. I know the city manager's proposed budget just came out this morning or last night. So I can't recall honestly whether it's in there or not. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to test your memory. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, so we'll, we'll have to, We'll have to look at that. Um, I, I, I can't tell you right now whether that's in there or not. So we'll, we'll look at that. And, and I think we can marry up at least the discussion and figure that out. Awesome, awesome. I'm also excited um, that this is gonna be citywide. Um, I know that, that uh, everybody loves to congregate including myself um, actually in, D in D6 and downtown Willow Glen and in downtown <laughs> areas. But we want that in all of our districts um, and so that it's accessible for everybody to enjoy the nice weather and a really good uh, meal. Um, by the way, I went to a Keys in uh, D2, I think it was D2, and uh, they were, they were uh, offering me the, uh, a swirl, which is, you know, their uh, famous uh, uh, margarita uh, flavored Very famous. Uh, drinks. Yeah on a to-go basis like you could walk outside with it and i thought well this is very very strange um but i'll take a swirl to make it watermelon <laughs> um so i look forward to being able to do that and with the meal sit sitting down so congratulations this is a great uh, great proposal yes to-go swirl is saving uh, the mental health of our city apparently customer canvas <laughs> Yeah, I want to make a correction that you had the uh, keys uh, in District 10, not District 2. We actually have, it's across the border. <laughs> but, uh, you mean on Blossom Hill? Yes. The, the is, it, is that D10? Yes, it is. That's D10. What? There is one on Lincoln Avenue, however. <laughs> uh, but I also, I, I, I do also want to potentially uh, address the, the um, allowing people to take home uh, uh, things uh, such as these swirls uh past this uh lightning because i think a lot of the businesses uh, that can that have specialty cocktails would benefit from staying in business as well uh you know past this when we start reopening some of this i think they'll still need to have that temporary moratorium that allows them to uh, deliver alcoholic beverages so i don't i don't know if that could be thought about as well okay well, there's going to be a lot of challenging issues, I know, with this one, and I'm hoping that we're going to be able to take this in something of a two-step. There's going to be lower hanging fruit that we hope we can do relatively easy, and we know that there's a lot of really hard stuff because we've gone through a little bit of it before with our uh, our parklets or whatever we're calling <laughs> these things now that have emerged in our parking spaces where we're allowing uh, decks and, and outdoor dining. Uh, there's just a lot of challenges in the public space, and so... Um, you know, it may be a whole lot easier for us just to decide to close down entire lanes of traffic uh, if that, rather than really grappling with all these unique challenges. So well, I guess we'll learn a lot in the weeks ahead. Okay, uh, any last questions or comments? Okay, uh, let's vote then on Councilmember Davis's motion. Arenas? Yes. Davis? Aye. Chemis? Yes. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and finally, uh, oh no, uh, two more items, I'm sorry. Monthly report of activities, uh, Joe? Hello, uh, Joe Rice, City Auditor. Um, I don't have a lot to uh, report on. So this is our monthly report for April. As you know, a, a number of our projects um, have been in progress for a little bit. Um, and uh, many of them were slated to come out in the springtime, but no, but we're still working with departments and uh, trying to wrap those up and pending capacity within the departments and the city manager's office uh, to provide feedback and response. We'll be getting those out at some point. We, it's, it's, it's kind of to be determined as, as you can imagine. Um, uh, with that, I ask that you accept our report and happy to answer any questions. Great. Any questions for Joe? Uh, Councilmember Camus, any questions for our bearded auditor? <laughs> 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 I think he needs a, a a visit to a hair salon, but uh, <laughs> I like it. It's a good look. <laughs> shaggy every I, day. <laughs> I prefer the clean shave look myself. But anyway, uh, 
On, first, I want to thank you, Joe, for um, adding the emergency management team um, into the, the agenda. It's an important that the city gets all the reimbursements possible to prevent uh, further impacts of COVID-19s uh, on, the, on the general fund. So thank you for doing that. Uh, but do you envision adding other audits, uh, assignments related to COVID-19, such as assessing service delivery for housing, meals, that kind of stuff? Right now, uh, we're taking a wait and see. We added this one project. It's, it's pretty much in line with our, our role in the emergency operations plan. We, we'll probably do a series of audits in that area, looking at kind of those costs. But we could potentially look into some of these, these other audit uh, audits as well. We're kind of like everybody else, we're kind of stretched with capacity just because about half our office is moved or not. A number of people in our office have moved into other disaster service worker roles, uh, working in with the logistics team or working with nonprofit assistance group and things of that nature. So we've got about three folks working on the COVID-19 documentation audit. Probably could free up a few more for a bit more audit work, but it's really just working with, uh, you know, the ESC folks, figuring out where we can add the most value. Um, and what yeah, that, that that's that's where I was going. I, I just want to make sure that we can get reimbursed uh, to 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 the, as much extent as we could uh, yeah. with the dollars that we have. And and if we need to prioritize it, then you have my blessings if if you need it. Okay. And, yeah. And so yeah. any any additional work I'll be bringing to you know I, I come to you all each month. I could add additional work uh, as as necessary. Okay, great. I'll make a motion to approve the report. Second. Thank you. Uh, hey, Joe, uh, my recollection, you, specifically auditor's team is very heavily involved in uh, the reimbursement process. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So appreciate that. It's going to consume an awful lot of your time, not just now, but for quite a while. Uh, for those assignments that are in process, like fleet maintenance, park maintenance, police staffing, obviously when you undertook those projects, we're operating on a very different set of assumptions than we have today about our staffing and our ability. Yeah. Um, is there an opportunity in all of those to sort of engage in a pivot on the focus? Uh, I know, you know, it's all around efficiency, but now efficiency is going to be viewed in a world of, of less rather than at the same capacity. Is that something you can incorporate into those audits? That's a that's a great question. So that's one thing we, we've been looking at is relooking at you know some of the recommendations and do, and how do they fit within the current budget environment? How do they fit with the current service environment? Um, and some might be a little bit longer term, and some may not make as much sense as they may have in a different uh, world. So we're looking at those um, again. A lot of them recommendations are about prioritization. It's about efficiencies. It's about uh, kind of uh, procedural type things and they, they still make sense um, but we're taking a taking a look making sure um, that the recommendations are they still are practical and in a, in, a, in, a, in in the sense of uh, what our current environment is okay thanks Joe uh, and I certainly don't want to in any way discourage you from deciding you need to pull the plug on something because it just doesn't seem as relevant to today's environment um, all right mr. Beekman Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to try to quickly offer that uh, you have technology deployment uh, uh, audit things from uh, your 2016 uh, deployment report, technology deployment uh, report. And, um, you know, I, I imagine from that, from that report that you, there, you used a lot of ideas from the San Jose Sunshine Ordinance of 2007, 2006, and that time. And I'm very sorry that I, you know, in the past previous years, that I did not mention the, the San Jose Sunshine Ordinance enough. And, you know, it's, it's work within, you know, our own city that, you know, it, it, that's an important piece of work to yourselves. And, um, yeah, I'm just sorry I did not include that more in, in talking about, uh, you know, all of my hopes for what accountability with technology at this time can be. And, and uh, so there was a good, you know, five or six years that you could practice the Sunshine Ordinance and 
with the mayor first, uh, you know, uh, becoming mayor in 2014, that began this new era of technology innovation. And I'm really hoping that there still can be time to meld those early sunshine ordinance ideas into, you know, what I, I'm trying to believe in is that the technology accountability, accountability of this time is really dedicated to ideas of peace and to end uh, to question shock doctrine practices. And, uh, you know, I think that can be a great combination how to address our future at this time. And uh, good luck in, in, in all our work towards the future of accountability with the community. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, very well. And motion, uh, let's vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, Joe. Welcome. All right. Uh, for our next item, I'm properly attired. It is the emergency mandate of fabric face coverings. Vice Mayor Jones. Vice Thank Mayor. you, Mayor. And uh, yes, you are appropriately covered. Thank you. Um, as I go out to go grocery shopping or run essential errands, uh, I'm really struck by the number of people who aren't wearing masks. And I'm not just talking about in the store, but I'm talking about around the stores and where people are congregating. And I just want to see some consistency. All the counties in the Bay Area have mandated face coverings. A um, couple of cities in Santa Clara County, Milpitas, Cupertino, and now I just uh, got a notice that Palo Alto has mandated face coverings. So I just want some consistency and some clarity. The county is urging people to have face coverings, but when people hear urge, that implies that they have the option. They, they can make the decision to wear face coverings or not. And I, I want to have, again, some consistency and some clarity in terms of when we go out in public, that there's a, a comfort level that we know that everybody who could potentially be asymptomatic, but yet contagious, and people who have symptoms are not spreading those, uh, the virus to, to others in the community. We're also talking about opening up in the process of opening up restaurants and, and businesses. And there's assumption that if we open it, they will come. And I can guarantee you if there's a segment of the population who if they do not feel comfortable being in those situations because of a lack of face covering, they're not gonna come. And it's gonna take longer for our, our economy and our businesses to open up and, and thrive. So that's why council member Jimenez and I have introduced this memo and I want to urge the council to uh, and the rules committee to support it. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, you know, I didn't say mandate, I said urge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Vice Mayor. I, I support the, the motion. I've had a chance to, or the, uh, the memorandum. I've, I've had a chance to talk with county leadership, and I think they're very open to cities moving forward um, as, as they wish. And I think it makes a lot of sense given uh, what we're all facing here. Uh, there are two members of the public who'd like to speak, uh, one with a phone number ending 4963. I'd like to give a second to, to Vice Mayor's oh, motion. Okay, thank you, Councilmember Rennes. Uh, on 4963, uh, you may be on mute. We're not able to hear you yet. Okay, I shouldn't be on mute now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I strongly support this. I wish it said urge. Uh, COVID-19 is having a disparate impact on seniors and on folks of color. And I can tell you that I'm going out, uh, I go out as rarely as I can, and I am absolutely infuriated at the number of people that are walking around without masks. And as far as I'm concerned, they're potential murderers, and I'm using that term advisedly. They're potential murderers. So thank you, Councilperson Jones, for this memo. And uh, I hope that when we do open, the county mandates masks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see you on the screen. I'm uh, I believe I have user number two. If you could at the same time turn off. Oh, you just, 
hung up, I believe. Okay, we'll wait just a moment to see if they want to re-engage. We'll come back to the, the committee and then we'll come back to you, uh, sir or ma'am. And if you're able to get back on, we'll listen to you then. Councilor McCamus. Yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in agreement too, I have to say, um, uh, with the memo. Uh, I do think it was gonna, it's gonna be very tough to enforce and I don't know, um, especially in our ethnic communities, I think that, that um, I don't want people to feel, I, mean, I don't know if it's gonna be that enforceable, but I am supportive of it as, you know, I don't know if uh, did if if Councilmember Jones or Jimenez talked to the police chief to to get his thoughts or or ideas. Is there uh, going to be a fine affiliated, for example? I did talk to the the chief. Uh, as you might guess, he wasn't a big fan of my proposal, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it's the right thing to do. And I use the analogy just like uh, traffic enforcement. We have laws against speeding, but we don't have an expectation that we're going to have police officers spending, you know, the majority of their time going after people who are speeding. It's, oftentimes, we make laws to keep honest people honest. So the, the vast majority of the, of the people, if they know it's a mandate, will do the right thing anyway. And then if you have a situation where you have an egregious offense, say you have somebody without a mask that's in the face of grandma, then that might be an opportunity to the, for the police to intervene. So it would be situational, but we want to, we want to keep honest people honest and have everybody uh, uh, comply with the, with the laws. And if, again, if you have individuals who are flaunting the laws or uh, intentionally uh, not complying, then, then th that's an opportunity for the police to intervene. No, I understood, but I, the person in grandma's face could be grandson and, um, you know, that, that's a lot more difficult than a cut and dry case, like a speeding ticket. Uh, so I, while I will support this, I feel that it could be, actually could be used against some people too. But in any case, um, I, I, there could be some unintended consequences, but I will support it. And Mayor, if I could just share a little yeah. perspective, I think, um, so certainly uh, we've talked it through. Um, Police Department does have quite a few concerns about the, the practicality of, of implementation and enforcement. Um, I, I do have a request, you know, the way the memo is structured, it, it it's directing us to issue an emergency order. I, I think this is better suited to going to council for, for council approval. Um, rather than typically we wouldn't issue an emergency order without a, 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 um, a compliance plan and, and so forth. So I think it's better suited to go to council. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, I can make that uh, modification and have it go to council for the 19th. Okay, is that okay with uh, Councilman Reyes? Uh, yes, of course. Okay, great. Uh, Blair Beekman. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask, uh, thank you that you would, uh, you'd be willing to bring this to council. And if you do, I bet. <clears throat> so Beekman, we seem to have lost you. Hi, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, it, it, it's short, I guess I'll just start again. Uh, you know, I thank you for uh, allowing the, uh, this to go to council and when it does can you um can you can can someone from the council can it be explained exactly why santa clara county has opted not to have the mass system uh, mandatory whereas every other county of the bay area has and what what are the reasonings behind uh, exactly why why that is is it farm reasons or i i don't know what it can be but uh if you could explain that that would be helpful thank you Right. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Okay. Um, yeah, I think um, we all have our eyes wide open about the enforcement challenges here, particularly given all that uh, this department's going to be dealing with. But and Mayor, uh, just yes. for clarification on the motion, the um, if it goes to council, is this just for discussion as to whether 
you want us to bring back an ordinance? I guess, I guess we'd want to have an ordinance to issue, wouldn't we? Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, you've got the 19th and then if the next time you can take action is in June. So uh, if, if you wanted an emergency ordinance, we'd have to get something on the agenda for next uh, Tuesday. And uh, yeah, that's, that's you know, if, if you're not going to issue it by order, we have to be uh, ready to go. Okay, what, what if I throw out this suggestion, given the challenges, of, I'm guessing you guys have a real workload constraint in trying to get something ready, an ordinance ready. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what how much this would take, but, um, you know, I, it, it just, a, I want to make sure I understand council's direction because right yeah. now the county order shelter in place at least goes through the 31st. So, Vice Mayor, let me just ask, would it be all right if we simply took uh, this to the council for a vote? Uh, in terms of uh, defining the outlines of this order. I know there are probably some variations out there that yeah. we'll want to talk about on the dais and then allow uh, the ordinance to come back. I'm, I'm a little concerned about us trying to race off because I know that there's already fights over whether or not you know joggers have to wear masks when they're out jogging and things of that nature. And I'm not sure that Rick's going to have all the guidance to just assume what we want. <clears throat> No, I'm 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 fine with that. Um, in, in most of the mandates, they have exemptions for hiking, jogging, riding your bike. Yeah, it's pretty pretty standard. Okay, so we'll go back if if the council directs. Then next Tuesday, we would bring an ordinance back on the second. It's if, fine. Well, you know, Vice Mayor, if you're convinced that we we have a pretty standard set of ordinances out there, we could simply cut and paste here, uh, and at least bring something. That's already written before the uh, before the council to consider. That is that something you'd want to try to do to identify an ordinance that's there. Definitely, if that, if that's something that Rick can get back. Oh, uh, let us look at it, and we'll say consideration. We'll, we'll agendize it for consideration of the emergency ordinance. All right. Uh, or approval, and uh, whether we have it, it uh, the only thing I'd say is something may not get out until Monday. Yeah, yeah, understood. All right, well, if there's something that qu cut and paste, great. And if this is something that requires an awful lot of debate and discussion, then obviously we'd have you come back. All right, all right. Great, thank you. All right, uh, on the motion then from Vice Mayor Jones, any other comments? All, right. all in favor? Aye. 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 Are there any opposed, any objections? Okay, that passes then unanimously, thank you. Um, we're on to uh, open forum. Uh, Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Check. I, maybe I'll say check, check from now on. Thank you. Uh, for a tough closing speech today. Uh, in San Jose and across the country, a narrative is developing that the, this pandemic is somehow the fault only of China and the WHO. With this thinking, the U.S. has been trying to practice a new round of warfare around the world at this time. As we are now in our third month of what may be at least a 24-month pandemic, at some point it will have to be taken into account that the U.S. has possibly had some sort of important supporting role in how this pandemic has started and that people in other countries will have to be held accountable and not willing to work through long-term negotiations and continual impasse. Can responsible vaccination processes for many different countries be ready soon and cut through the bureaucratic, uh, media, the bureaucratic and media red tape of the nations of the world? And what is the current state of the COVID-19 variation clotting the blood of children and young people? These are issues that need to be worked out between us. I feel with help from technology accountability practices and other human rights ideas for the US at this time to better acknowledge their own large roles in 9-11-01 and the economic meltdown of 2008. It would naturally invite China, the, the WHO and others, what could be their own more positive long-term sustainability practices. And I think you would hear a collective sigh of relief uh, not only from in San Jose, but from other local communities and, lo and local governments from around the world as well, if we were to all work on our good practices and good ideals. Uh, thanks a lot for the meeting today. It was, uh, it was a good meeting. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the individual calling from phone number 4963, again, the number ending 4963, please unmute yourself. Yes, uh, the office of the city clerk is perhaps the most, one of the most important offices down at city hall. Citizens, commissioners, and council members are dependent on the city clerk's office to get the right advice or that it, consequences can be devastating as we saw with the uh, council person man win and as we're currently seeing with the issue of the ballots. Also, they're supposed to serve the public and the public is not supposed to be serving them. For six years, I have filed form 700 in paper, both for computer reasons and for visual reasons, have a, have a visual problem and generally deal in paper and not sitting in front of a computer. So I went down on the 12th of February to fill out the paper, as I've been doing for six years. The person who was assigned to the task was very angry. I came out and said she wanted me to file instead on the computer. I told her there had been problems in the past, but I let her bully me into attempting it. The attempt failed. We kept getting error messages. So I asked for the paperwork. I filled it out. I turned it in, and I got a stamp. Now I'm informed uh, 13 weeks later that the city clerk staff person gave me the wrong form and I'm supposed to be doing this online. So I have a real issue about the city clerk's office giving out the wrong forms, uh, failing to respond to emails when I emailed repeatedly and asked for help. And it was only today when I again asked what was going on that I'm told, we gave you the wrong form. Sorry. Well, I understand that the clerk regrets it, but there has to be more accountability in that office because the consequences for, for, for members of the public, commissioners, and council members who are given the wrong information is huge. So I'll be dealing with, with the clerk offline, and I'll also be calling the Fair Political Practices Commission. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you.